Law. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Trump's Plan for Revenge if Reelected. Uh, you might have heard it this week. Um, I like to call, I should have changed the title of this talk called um, Trump's Veteran Vermin Speech. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit from this speech that he gave. And um, it's a new, uh, a new inflection point, as Jay likes to say. And it's the following. He said, we will root out the communist, Marxist, fascist, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country, lie, steal, and cheat on elections, and will do anything possible, whether legally or illegally, to destroy America and the American dream. To discuss Donald Trump, his plans to do, if re what he's going to do when he's reelected, and the vermin speech, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Tim. May I say that neither of you guys look like vermin to me. Thank you, because uh, I'm sure if Trump is reelected, he'll have an opinion about that, and he'll disagree with you. Uh, you know, Jay. So, Tim, real quick, I, I just have to ask, right? Sure. For somebody like Adolf Trump, uh, sorry, I mean, that's, he recently changed his name. For Adolf Trump, are there ver women or only ver men? Gotcha. That's a M I N. <laughs> Not M E N. <laughs> Play of words there, I think, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, Jay, another inflection if point. If you take uh, this guy seriously, you deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Rachel Maddow had a show, and she mentioned the book Strongman by Ruth Ben Gatt, G H I A T. And in this book, um, he describes what Trump is doing, and we've known this for years. We've seen it before, but now he's putting a special twist on it. Uh, pages right out of uh, Mein Kampf, almost, and that is to reduce the Americans' uh, uh, sensitivity to this kind of language, this kind of uh, fascist uh, language that dehumanizes uh, human beings and allows Americans to consider taking pot shots at human beings. Violence. Uh, the idea is that um, you make it seem that violence and classifying people as non-human is patriotic, it's justified, and it's morally righteous. And that, that is spelled out in this book called Strongman. Uh, your thoughts about Donald Trump and his Veteran Day speech, well, let's call it the vermin speech. What do you think? It's, it's, fasc it's fascist, or it's Nazi, or it's both. Um, you know, I, I think he's um, he's being more aggressive now in his language, more aggressive in his promise to um, to gain vengeance over people who have, have spoken against him. What I find interesting is that the, the, the list of people that he mentions, the ones he wants to have vengeance over, people in, in large part that he himself appointed and who turned against him in one way or another, at least in his perception. Now, I mean, what is interesting about that is they're not around. They weren't at the speech. Um, nobody, nobody came, uh, but still he has the base. So what you have is two lines on the chart. The ones he, you know, appointed, the ones who turned against him, you know, they're, they're on the downside. They're not interested in helping him anymore. But the base seems to be willing to help him. The base seems to agree with that. The base goes along with his greater suggestions of violence and his threats for vengeance. I'm going to find that very interesting because the base, while, while the guys who turned against him get to be smarter or seem to be smarter, not really smart, the people in the base seem to be at least steady and maybe increasing in their ardor, in their you know, affection for him. And the question is whether those polls are right. I mean, one of the one of the points in the review of that book on Rachel Maddow was, uh, what are they what are they thinking? Those people they are they are responding to his appeal for vengeance. They are responding to his appeal for violence, and so he's testing. He's testing to see whether they will come along with him. And the answer, although it's not quite clear yet, the answer is maybe they are. Um, maybe the, the wilder his, his rhetoric gets, the more support he gets from the base, uh, which is really troubling. 
um, they're they following um, the the handwriting that says let's do more violence uh, and let's get vengeance. Uh, so um, this is troubling in the sense that um, there's polls out there. We, we we don't really believe the polls, but maybe they're right and th that that say that that he could win or will win. Uh, and then the package includes the vermin speech. This is as scary as it gets. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Jay, for that. Hey, Chuck, let's let's go with uh, Jay's observation. That is, um, this speech, the vermin speech, <clears throat> was directly intended for his base. But let's extrapolate that a little bit more. If, if it's just intended for the the, the base, Trump uh, MAGA followers. What's it say about the non-MAGA GOP and the independents not to raise uh, criticism, not to speak out against this kind of speech, this kind of fascist, distinctly fascist kind of speech? Um, do they just lay in the, the weeds like a, you know, a bass in the weeds and, and say nothing as usual for the last seven years? Or do they spark up and say something? I haven't heard anything, really, uh, not too much from from the GOP and from uh, from the the national uh, Republican, um, they have, they haven't said anything that organization, and certainly uh, independents really haven't sparked up. Your thoughts? Okay, so two things. One, I am truly inspired and impressed to see that Jay has regained his pinnacle of brilliance and insightfulness, which was so woefully lacking just before this show and had <laughs> me seriously concerned. <laughs> Good Secondly, thing we don't know about either of that. I know when not to respond, Chuck. <laughs> There's a first time for everything, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So second thing for your question, Jay is right, as usual on these shows, if Trump is the testor, and if his base are the testees, you get what you pay for. Is, is it the base as the testees, or is it the non-mega independents as the testees? <laughs> this, is, this is a family show, so I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about Speaker Johnson or about testees. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the base. <laughs> Experiments. Regain composure. Okay. But... You're doing the best you can to throw me off my base here. <laughs> yeah, Jay, Jay's... <laughs> All right, continue, please. Jay's, Jay's having some muscle spasms, but we'll get back. We'll get back to that. Uh, so, no, but your let question... me say that, you know, when you're talking about the base or the, uh, you know, the, the people who are not in the base, uh, independence, whatever, um, you're talking about the electorate, okay? electorate, whoever goes down to the polls and votes. That's what we're talking about. And let me let me add, let me add that that is a, a sliding scale. That is a moving target. Do not forget for one moment, okay, that that um, that he has um, been involved in an, an enormous initiative to try to screw up um, voting rights and suppress voting. Those steps that were taken a year or two ago are still in place in many states. And so it's not clear who, who the electorate is. Furthermore, and, and they, could, they could vote for him, even though we don't anticipate um, you know, th that they would win in a given state, uh, they might because of the suppression. The other thing, don't forget, and there was an article about this, uh, an opinion piece in the Times by David Ignatius this morning. Uh, to the to the proposition that um, the month of October <clears throat> was Putin's best month, and one of the things uh, in in that article, many things happen in October that that Putin likes. Uh, it's a sad article, actually. One of the things is uh, you know the fact that Trump might be president, and that that Trump has uh, control through his fellow uh, Johnson um, that Chuck continually refers to in affectionate terms. Um, and and, the, and so don't forget Putin. Putin likes Trump. There is no question that Putin will try to help Trump. No question, as he did last time and the time before. He will be using social media 
with an AI spin uh, approaching November. He will try to help Trump in social media. And there are, I mean, I'll go on record here, there are a lot of people in this country who are suggestible, completely suggestible to social media. They don't know the difference between right and wrong or, or truth and fiction. I mean, and they can get so confused. Look at the college campuses on the Middle East question. It's incredible. These kids are so ignorant, and they have been made ignorant by social media. The, the population, the electorate will be made ignorant by social media, uh, driven by Putin. So Putin, Trump, they're still totally together. Putin will help Trump. Trump will help Putin. Um, and, and the day that Trump takes office, the war in Ukraine will be lost, finally, forever. Uh, it won't be a stalemate anymore. It'll be over. So all I'm saying is that they got a relationship, those two, and you got to factor that in to who will win and what Trump will do if and when he wins. Okay, great. Good, good, good analysis on that. Hey, uh, Chuck, you know, uh, I want to pinpoint a little bit on what Jay just said about Putin's influence on this 2024 election and certainly um, in previous elections, uh, particularly just 2016. You know, um, if that's true, and, and Putin is encouraging Trump to uh, take the pathway of the fascist, uh, you know, I'm reminded, and maybe you remember this, but remember a, a gentleman from Russia named uh, Nick uh, Khrushchev, leader of Russia, Soviet Union. And he said to John F. Kennedy, he said, Russia will take you, I'm going to paraphrase, Russia will take you and not a shot will be fired. Uh, are we there in those days of... Uh, Khrushchev's prediction coming true with Putin's influence with Donald Trump and certainly influence in the pending 2024 election? Well, I think to respond to that, we need to focus on a truly brilliant insight that the Jay's recovery has enabled him to share with us. And that is <laughs> that when voters go into the voting booth, what they do and why they do it is completely different than when they respond to quite biased polls. They're selective in the demographics, they're selective in their wording, they're selective in their interpretation of it. I mean, three wrongs do not make a right. So that difference is critical. Putin and Adolf Trump, on the other hand, are peas in a pod. They are vultures of a feather. <clears throat> they will rise or fall together. Trump has attached himself to Putin because Putin has achieved that rise <clears throat> essentially unimpeded and unimpaired. <clears throat> Trump aspires to that. <clears throat> he is aspiring now by attacking <clears throat> his opponents exactly the same way that Putin attacks Ukraine and the West and the NATO alliance. That analogy, that simile, is apt and instructive and illuminating. And I think Jay has opened that to our understanding in ways that we really need to understand. So yeah. thank you, Jay. Thank you, Chuck. Nice comments. But let me add a couple of things. May I, Tim, just a couple of things here. <clears throat> Number one is... Uh, so. <laughs> When 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 uh, when Trump makes these statements uh, threatening people who he hired and who served him, they were his acolytes sometimes for years, and uh, late lately later and even now they come out against him. Okay, and they testify against him, and he's really ticked off about that. What does that mean in the next administration? If he if he is elected somehow, if he it squeaks by somehow, um, then um, the, he's going to be selecting people again, right? And he is going to be selecting people who are not only acolytes, but perfect acolytes, people who are more loyal to him than ever before. You know, in his bag of um, Teflon Don tri uh, tricks, the guy has a way to corrupt everybody. I am reminded of the James Comey movie, Comey rules, where there were these strange conversations between Trump and, and Comey. It's in Comey's book. 
um, you know, where where he he undermined him and then fired him anyway. Um, and the same thing with his successor. So what what you get is the prospect of fantastic acolytes who are sworn to protect Trump, who are less likely to ever turn against Trump. Furthermore, part of what he's talking about here in this in this uh, fascist speech he made, okay, is to completely corrupt and undermine our our uh, law enforcement agencies and our intelligence agencies, which he was doing for most of his term. Think about it. Even way back in uh, Helsinki, he was undermining, you know, uh, American intelligence. Okay, if he gets back in office, that's the first, you know, they say the first step, kill all the lawyers, right? Nah. The first step, kill all the intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies, and for that matter, tax collection agencies. He will wreck those organizations on day one. Which well, means he's already promised. He, he already he, promised he, that he'll he'll enact the Insurrection Act on day one. That too. That's another thing. But in terms of the law enforcement, what he will do is he will turn them. He will weaponize them. He will use them against his adversaries. And in fact, he will put people in jail. You know, he will build a camp. He said that in the speech. He's going to build a camp for his enemies. And God knows who is going to be in that camp. And if he controls and reorganizes all the law enforcement agencies, which he can and probably knows well enough how to do, um, there'll be a lot of people in those camps. It will be, it will, it will take us right to 1939, I'm telling you. Well, let me suggest who he put in those camps. Um, and he said in his, his Berman speech, um, the radical left. He called them radical left thugs, but anyone he deems as a radical left. And who is that? Anyone who disagrees with him. Anyone who criticizes him. That's the radical left. Um, so that's the answer to your question. Um, let, me, let me go to Chuck. And I, Chuck, I want to talk about this point about weaponization of the FBI and the DOJ. Uh, on Univision this week, he said the following. Um, they, they've let the genie out of the box. You know, when you're the president and you've done a good job and you're popular, you don't go after them so that you can win an election. So by those words, he has rationalized um, weaponization of the law enforcement agencies because he feels that he has been the subject of weaponization, that these 91 indictments is a direct uh, direct correlation to the fact that he was a great president and the radical leftists don't like that. And they don't want a, a quote unquote, a great president to be president again. So uh, can you see his, his rationalization and how far does that go? Well, it might not be expected in the response. I think we need to start with, again, the brilliant and forensically raised point from Jay that Trump needs and may be jeopardizing by his fascist speeches and words, the evangelical. Trump needs them to see him as Christ, truly. But if you look at how Trump has treated his disciples versus Christ, even Judas, who did much worse than any of the people Trump is attacking, Christ never said a bad word or took an adverse action against Judas, ever. That is Christ. That is Christian. Trump is the Antichrist. Well, we know that the, the, uh, the evangelical movement um, has, for, for many years now, has compared him as some kind of, um, not so much the Christ, but um, uh, referenced in the the Old Testament as a biblical savior, and um, I forgot exactly King. Um, can't remember exactly what King uh, Trump is compared to, but uh, to liberate liberate this country from um, uh, forces that the evangelicals don't like. Yeah, and, I think so, it was King Tut. Well, I, I'm not going back that far. Um, <laughs> but you know, here we are with. Now you're blending, of course, uh, religion and politics. That's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, but there we are. Many of Trump's base, his MAGA followers, are exactly that. And remember, when you mix politics and religion, guess what you don't need? 
You don't need evidence. You don't need facts to support your claims. Why? Because religion is a faith-based you know, function. So why do you need facts and, and, and evidence when you're dealing with faith? And so the faithful of Donald Trump are just that, faithful. They don't need anything other than what Donald Trump tells them what they need. And here we go. That's a big part of his 33% hold on the electorate. Now, what scares me is, where is the independence? Where are the non-mega GOP to say, uh, that's not how we run this country? Yet crickets are heard. Now and then you'll hear a you know, a Republican spout out, but it, you know, it's all for one day news cycle and then it goes away. Um, your thoughts about that blending of religion and Trump support? Yeah, I think that's a great, very cogent question, Tim. And I think what we need to understand about that, again, is putting it back in the Trump versus Christ context, that there will be there are now, and there will be possibly increasing real Christians with a glimmer, at least, of conscience, of intelligence, of character, of morality, who will recognize, believe, and maybe even act once they're in that private voting booth on the understanding that Trump is the opposite of Christ and Christianity and the core values. That well, is that wishful thinking? On your part, sorry to put it that way, but no, I don't. I don't think it is. I think if you could design a poll that would identify, hey, call them evangelical Christians, but devout Christians, hey, and you, in a private, this is your vote, not mm. a poll, but this is your vote context. What would you choose as a matter of personal choice and conscience? I think if you could get honest answers to that honest question, I think you would see a shift in whatever portion of real Christians with real character, conscience, integrity there may be among his base. Well, it'd be nice to know that <clears throat> these evangelicals would have in their voting booth a um, copy of the Old Testament open to the page of the Ten Commandments saying, Thou shalt not have false idols, which Clearly, Donald Trump is, um, but I don't think that's going to happen. Hey, Tim, let me let me jump in on this. This morning, I was watching a, a, something out of 1978 over um, ethics as applied to the military, okay? and uh, it was very interesting. Is it had a bunch of um, people, um, some of whom were in the military and uh, trained young recruits and all this, and the idea was that you, you built them to do your mission, whatever it was, including killing people. Um, and you, 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 you stripped off any kind of morality or religion, uh, ethical principles they brought with them, and you taught them to obey your orders no matter what. Okay? Now, first of all, I want to say that what, what Trump is selling, in fact, what these evangelistic groups are selling is not religion. It is not religion. You're making some kind of old-time statement about religion about ethics and morality and religion and the Bible, eh, gone. <clears throat> what we have is a kind of army. And this, this is a Trump army. When he gives the commands, the, you know, the stochastic commands, they follow. I don't know how that happened, but it's sort of like a military thing. They follow no matter what, okay? Remember the Insurrection Act. Uh, remember the fact that he, he has a lot of support in the military. We were lucky they didn't, you know, turn in his favor actively uh, during his administration, during, you know, at the end of his administration. But I want to add this, we haven't really covered this, is we are walking around thinking that this is going to be a fair election. We are walking around thinking that somehow, you know, the suppression of votes, particularly on racial bases, um, is not going to affect it that much. And that uh, social media is not going to affect it from Putin, is not going to affect it that much. Well, even assuming that, let me ask you guys a rhetorical question, and then I'll answer it. Do you think that Trump will accept a loss in 2024? Do you think that? The answer is no. We, he'll be back. He'll be back saying that the other guys, it's a given, and he will be better prepared. He will have more uh, followers out there that 
that agree with him and want to see him president, even if he fair and square lost. So I think we're going to have the same experience, but much worse in 2024. Either he, he wins, which actually I don't think he will. He wins the vote or he loses the vote and then does a, a 2020 thing again uh, in, in you know more aggressive form. Do you disagree? No, I don't. There's no way he's going to accept the election results. Only if it clearly shows that he was the, the victor. And then, of course, he'll say, yeah, it was a fair and square election, even with the mail-in ballots. Yeah, that's chilling. It's chilling. But I think when you shake it and bake it, that's what we have coming. That's what we have coming. That's what we have to expect. And, you know, I hate to say it, but um, Americans and the federal government better be prepared for it because I don't think it's going to be pretty. It's going to be far worse than the last time. I, I like to be proven wrong. Uh, that's the last thing I want to say. Well, don't forget the Insurrection Act. So he takes office physically. He gets into the White House. He corrupts the DOJ, the FBI, all the law enforcement intelligence. He corrupts all the generals. I mean, let's say if you're in charge of the military, who's going to oppose you? I mean, you, you have done a coup d'etat. You, you have performed a successful coup d'etat by taking over the military. And then no one will be able to, to roost you from your, uh, from your position because you've now declared yourself a dictator or, or, or a leader for the American people, however he's going <laughs> to put that. Uh, hey, Chuck, let's go. We, we're running out of time here. In fact, we're almost out of time. I just want to touch on the last thing. And Donald Trump has promised um, deportation of um, illegal immigrants uh, to the numbers greater than never seen in 150 years. Uh, Stephen Miller, his um, commandant in arms, has uh, proposed uh, many, many warehouses in the uh, southwest near the border, and that will house, quote unquote, millions of people uh, for deportation. Are you buying that? Is this another is this another build the wall kind of um, uh, uh, scenario? See, there's a problem <coughs> for them, which Jay's brilliance in this episode at New Heights is helping us to understand. Look at the military leadership. His own appointed military leadership has almost to a man turned against him. Analogize that to the Christian evangelical where the leaders have not spoken up. They don't have the spines, the consciences, the characters to speak up. But the military leaders, Millie and others, have. If the leaders are doing that, and their men and women are looking at and listening to them for leadership, how extensive will the inroad on Trump's allegiance be among that rank and file with those leaders? So I think things are happening that are not going to show up in polls. Those are very private individual okay. voting let me, vote actions. Let me ask you this final question, and we'll conclude. We'll go to final thoughts. And that is, what institution, other than, I hate to say it, wishful thinking that people change their minds once they're inside the voting booth, what institution, and this is what Rachel Maddow was trying to get at, what institution is going to be successful to cast a light on this um, newfound fascist speech, or, or, or stochastic fascist speech, and... Um, Quell it. Stop it. Who, who's going to do that? What institution might do that? The other institution that Adolf Trump and DeSantis and Cruz and those guys are attacking, and that is higher education. That is. It takes one... generations. We don't have generations. We don't have time for it. Yeah. Then yeah. who? If higher education leadership particularly charismatic leadership in higher education, stands up to Adolf Trump. Yeah. I, I agree there, with you wholeheartedly, but, um, yeah. You don't and, need institution to defeat Adolf mm -hmm. Trump. You need individuals in private confidential voting booths to defeat Adolf Trump. It happened in 2020. It, it happened, happened in 2016. We all know what a monster he was back in 2016. What happened then? It didn't happen then. Right. My point. But since then, every single national election and most of the major 
state elections 2020, 2022, 2023, it has happened. Expectations of Republicans and gains of Republicans have been eroded. Expectations of Democrats and gains of Democrats have been exceeded. That is now a three-year yeah, trend yeah. because <clears throat> not the institutions, Individuals in private confidential voting booths are exercising a degree of independence and conscience that no Republicans ever thought possible. They're going to use gerrymandering, voter roll purging, <clears throat> elimination of access to and mail ballot. Every trick in the book, to borrow from the song, that they can to prevent those individual choices of conscience from happening or being counted. Okay. They will do anything they can, but that's the question. I, I hope you're right. I, I really do hope you're right, but I, I, I am suspicious on that point, but I do hope you're right. Uh, Jay, um, we go to last thoughts. Uh, one institution, uh, Rachel Maddow suggests there are no institutions out there except for one, and that's the GOP party itself to stand up against this. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I heard her say that. I thought that was a pretty weak answer. Uh, I, 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 she must be scrambling to come up with them because they they've been busted. You know, they they're fragmented. They have they have no heart, no soul, no no principles, no nothing. Um, you know, I, honestly, I think the answer is there is none. It's certainly not the Supreme Court. It's not Congress. Um, I, maybe uh, some group, um, a coalition of governors who are blue state governors? I don't know. I, no, there's nothing out there now. But I want to add one thing, though, in talking before uh, about, um, you know, what, what will happen if he loses. Well, he will claim to have won. He will say that Joe Biden did it to him again. And, uh, he, and Joe Biden, you know, lied and stole the election yet again. And then he will have, you know, all his people join him, all his acolytes join him in that, in the chorus, okay? <clears throat> and there and there will be a scramble for the White House. Um, there'll be all kinds of dirty tricks um, about letting the government continue. Um, and, uh, and, you know, tricks by the Republicans in the House and the Senate, for that matter. Um, and no one will know who really won, okay? Enter chaos, chaos. Enter the military. <clears throat> Don't forget Tommy Tuberville, who's been holding up virtually hundreds of promotions of senior officers. Okay, I think this is a long plan. Remember that Tuberville is a, um, aside from being a, a, a terrible coach, uh, he, he, was, uh, he is a Trumper completely. And he will follow whatever Trump tells him, like many others in you know, the House and the Senate. Um, so maybe, just maybe, this is a selection process. It's kind of an inverted selection process of what officers Trump would like to see promoted or not promoted. So what, what he's doing is he's rebuilding the military in an image that he can rely on with human, human capital, human resources, senior officers that he can rely on when he pulls when he pulls the plug on the military and says, I want you to enforce my election because I was the true winner. Um, and, and they come along under the Insurrection Act or otherwise, and they put down um, Biden as the real winner. So I, I think this is part of Trump's plan because his plan uh, includes use of the military under the Insurrection Act. You know, it's, it's, it's a good thought. Um... But I think as of yesterday, it passed the Senate to break the logjam of uh, military, military appointments and promotions. Um, not all in mass. There's certain positions in the military that will require individual approval. But as far as um, many of those, they can be done in groups. And I think that actually passed yesterday in the Senate. We're not out of the woods on that. So then Tuberville's machinations may not you know, have the same weight as I thought until you told me this. But nevertheless, let's assume that, you know, Trump has power over the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, and the, um, you know, the leaders of the various branches of service. He has power over that as president. 
and he will try to create the military in his own image on a short leash basis, uh, right after election day, what have you, uh, and use them. I mean, they, they have to be part of his plan. And uh, I'm sure there are people who are advising him about this right now. I find it extraordinary, by the way, that Stephen Miller would be talking about camps and putting, putting uh, liberals in camps. And Stephen Miller is the, uh, is the successor to a, a Holocaust family, isn't he? And it's extraordinary that he would come out. I guess not. How quickly we forget. They're also agreed to reinstate the zero tolerance policy, and that's separating infants and young children from their parents in I order to that. be as a disincentive for uh, people to come into the United States under legal assumption or asylum rules. Okay. So let me, let me add one other last point, though, Tim, and that's this. People can and should see these things. They can and should, you know, vote against him on this basis. But, but it's not clear to me that they will either see these things or vote against him. And, and I think it's really up for grabs about how, how well Biden does on Biden's big initiatives and how well social media does on Putin's initiatives. But I, I, I do not feel that, that rational decisions, that a lot of people will be making rational decisions. I agree. That's why we're talking about it today. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, last thoughts, Chuck. So I, I, I want to, again, commend, commend and admire Jay's brilliance. I mean, just Jay has been consistently at a very high level today. I think one of the best that we've seen. Two things. One, individual, independent, confidential choices of conscience inside the sanctity of a voting booth will make the difference, or it won't. And from, from your lips to God's ears, I hope so. No. Yep. And number two, everything that we can do, as Jay has done so eloquently in this session, to inspire, to instill, to activate, to nurture, to cultivate those independent choices of conscience in the privacy of the voting booth is our responsibility. Okay, thank you. Nicely stated. Amen. Uh, Jay, uh, last thought? Yeah, I, I feel at, at one level, I feel very threatened by what is happening. Uh, you know, we've been talking about Trump since the days of Trump week and uh, I mean, if you went back, Tim, and you looked at our earlier shows where we discussed uh, things, you would say uh, at the time, uh, gee whiz, they're really taking a leap on this. It's not that bad. But you know what? We were prescient. It, it, it was that bad, and it is that bad. And, and the question is whether in taking a leap on worrying about the, the election in 2024, um, we're, we're, we're overstating the risk. Um, and I really don't have a clear answer on that. Maybe Chuck is right. Maybe the electorate will do the right thing. Maybe Trump will. Maybe Trump's outrageous statements about vermin and the like uh, will will bounce back. Maybe all these trials will somehow affect the people in the voting booths. It's not clear. Um, but maybe maybe we can be optimistic about that. So I'm really. I said this before. I'm on the edge on this, and I think the country is on the edge on this. I agree. Um, to address your comment about seven years ago when we were talking about Trump, I think we knew the heart of a fascist back then, and gee, it hasn't changed. So I'd like to thank my, my co-host, Jay Fidel, and certainly our special esteemed guest, Chuck Frumpton, for their, their wise comments. And uh, I'm hoping that um, their predictions will not come true and come true. So um, we'll see how that all shakes out. We'll hear more about Trump's vermin speech and more vermin speech to come. I'm sure of it in the next 12 months. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for joining us here at American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apatel, your host. And until next week, aloha.